Welcome to the Leading Real Change podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, an expert in workplace culture change. From my unique background in behavior science, public health, and community advocacy, I help corporate leaders with evidence-based individual, team, and organizational change to create thriving workplace cultures for all. In the Leading Real Change podcast, I interview dedicated and passionate change makers about their careers, how they lead change, and what leaders can do today to make a difference, to build healthy, inclusive workplace cultures for all. I'm excited to share these examples of real workplace change with you. You'll learn about effective strategies that are working and how to overcome real barriers to change that challenge us every day. I hope you'll feel inspired and more confident to keep leading change in your workplace. Please share this podcast with other HR, DEI or ERG leaders who you know are working hard, but are struggling to have an impact and need more support to effectively create a thriving workplace culture for all today. My name is Kate Ebner, and I am the founder and CEO of the Nebo Company. We are a leadership development organization that brings leadership coaching and strategic visioning and organizational development work to our clients. And I'm also the founder of an institute at Georgetown University called the Institute for Transformational Leadership. And I think what what I'll also say about all of this is that I'm fascinated by what it takes for a leader to lead change and to change a system and in the process of doing so to grow and transform as a human being. And so I like to talk about and think about helping people achieve the missions of their organizations, which often involves shifts in their own thinking and shifts in their organization. So those are the things I'm passionate about. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. So let's dive right into how you got here, your career. How did you become interested in this? And what was your career path like? Was Did you face any challenges along the way in terms of burnout, motherhood, or being a woman, or any biases along the way? Or did you just describe your career, but also any obstacles you overcame in that process too? Sure. I will tell you that I grew up in a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania and was fortunate to travel to Middlebury College in Vermont, where I was an English major and a creative writer. And so one of the things that I'll, I say all of this, because I think when you're an English major, a lot of people say, are you going to be a teacher? Or are you going to be a writer? And so my answer to both of those questions long ago was neither. <laughs> but I didn't know about the type of work that I do right now. And so I think in many ways, part of my path was really to, to find a type of work where a curious human oriented person like me could, could explore and write and think and help other people develop their potential. And so my path started at Middlebury the year after I graduated, I stayed on and worked in residential life. And it was a great laboratory of human experience, especially as I worked with first-year students. And then I went on to work as a strategy consultant. I, at one point, was a chef for a family and was a personal chef and was really, I think, as that English major, looking and searching for what do I do with this. And I think that it was actually uh, my mentor who reached out to me and said, you belong in education, come back. And so I actually went back to the college and worked in student life for almost a decade. And in doing that, I had a front row seat to the experience of young people over the four-year journey of college, but also how the institution itself prepares itself to deliver on education and and a, a safe and healthy learning experience. It was an extraordinary laboratory for learning about people and systems and organizations. And I was asked by the board of trustees and the president of the college to co-lead a major change initiative. And it was at that point I learned about this thing called organizational development and the fact that this was actually a field. My job was to convince a very reluctant student body and faculty and alumni body 
that a big change proposed by the president and the board was something that that they could go along with. And so I spent a whole year helping to pitch and share the vision for change. It was my first experience working with vision. And we had lots of rotten vegetables thrown at us. It was a very unpopular idea at the start, but we were able to take the reactions of the community and actually influence and shape that vision. And that really is what got me started on the path that I'm on. I went on to return to the strategy consulting environment where I was a chief people officer. And my job there was to take another vision and translate the people strategy to achieve that vision. And it was at that time that part of the reason I took that position, Jacqueline, was because I found in the college environment, which is a 24-7 environment, as a mother of young children, I really needed a job that had more boundaries and less life and death compelling human issues. So I worked as a chief people officer for uh, another eight years. And during that time, earned my certificate in coaching at Georgetown University, founded the Nebo company and began the journey down the path that I'm on. And I think the only couple of other things I would say about this path is in the year 2001, 2002, when I was becoming trained as a leadership coach, it was a very new field. And there was a sense that it was kind of an out there field. So it was, it felt like a big risk to invest my professional life on this path. And I was the primary uh, breadwinner in my family and my husband was the at-home parent. So I also needed to be successful from the start in order to support my family. And I think some of the courage and conviction that it took to make the career shift into the field I'm in now has served me very well as an entrepreneur building first the Nebo company and then also the Institute at Georgetown. That's fantastic. No, thank you for that background journey because it relates to so much of what we're going to talk about. And again, I think when you've taken those risks yourself and shown that courage, that, that's the empathy you need for, for the leaders you're working with. But the same, as you said, when you're leading change, you are getting rotten vegetables thrown at you. So it's, okay, how do you use them to shape the vision, like you mentioned, but also be to be prepared for them? Change is such a challenge for so many people. Thank you for, for describing that. And I can really relate to that desire to want to think and write. And, and that was a privilege that I had when I was in academia as well. So I can relate to that. So before we go into some of the the work you do around helping people create their vision and and the feedback that builds that vision into a a more comprehensive and inclusive vision, tell me a little bit about how leaders are feeling today. What are the challenges they're facing today? It it definitely seems, obviously, we've been through COVID, but we're in this post-COVID period, and it's just constantly changing with new Supreme Court decisions, et cetera. It's a really challenging time to be a leader and to be leading change and to be coping with all the change that's happening in the world of work. I think that's true. I think one distinction that I see about the 2020s so far is that we're all leading change, whether we like it or not. And so you think about how organizations will create a vision and a strategic plan. And so we're this sort of this intention around change and evolution and revolution toward the future that, that everybody knows they want. And so I think that all is still happening, but the external environment, the pandemic, the, some of the conditions that you were just mentioning, the acceleration of technology innovation and the way that's affecting the workplace, the hybrid workplace itself. These external factors are creating continuous change that surrounds the organization and its mission and its own strategic planning and focus efforts. And so I think leaders today are are finding that the challenges of leading have to do with being able to maintain a perspective about what's happening right now and in the near future and in the farther future, even as they drive results as planned within their organizations. And so it takes a great deal of agility and resilience. I'd say a really good sense of humor (laughs) helps, but also a need for self, I want to say, I'm trying to avoid saying self-care, but I'll say it self-care and attention to your own stamina. Many people feel overwhelmed. 
And I think when we spoke previously to you mentioned that some of the leaders are facing greater resistance than ever. Obviously, we, you mentioned resistance from the start that can be there for any change program. But I think that the forms of resistance are changing and increasing in some ways. I think the forms of resistance can look like anything from, for example, right now, working with a number of clients who are trying to figure out what it means to be a hybrid workplace and can we enforce policies about being in the workplace or is that a losing battle and one we'd rather not have, right? So it's a form of resistance, right? Like you want us to come back, but I don't want to come back. Do I have to? And what if I don't? And so it, it, it I think there's a, a great need for leaders right now to be able to speak persuasively and compellingly about the changes that they want to see and why they really matter. And uh, so I think bringing people with you is critically important and not always that easy right now. So what are some of the strategies that you use to help leaders overcome the challenges they're facing and to lead change? What are the best practices that you recommend? I would say maybe there's a few ideas for me to share today here. And the first one is very simple. And it's really about understanding that in order to lead people forward, you have to be able to see where you are and where you're going. So this is where maintaining an accurate perspective on the current state is so important. Like what's really happening in this organization right now? And let me not look away from the difficult things. Let me look at them as well as positive things and have that courage to do that. Also, where are we going? Can I see the future and articulate a compelling vision of the future that people can then understand and begin to organize their efforts to toward? Use a vision, and by vision, I don't mean one lofty sentence, but really a detailed story of the future. Where will we be in three years? What will it look like? What will it be like? How will we be operating? What will be the benefits? What will be the impact of the changes? That way, as you start to ask people to move in that direction, they really understand why and they're really getting on board. So I think being able to see where you are and see where you're going would be my first strategy. And I don't know if you'd like to comment on any of that. Yeah, I think that also makes me think about this issue of not recognizing the problems with the status quo. I was just reading an article recently and, and saying that managers in particular, they don't want to admit that they're a manager in a company that doesn't support equality, right? Because they want to be proud of the place they work. It's that cognitive dissonance that we often experience with change is just denial of I work for the type of company that wouldn't be doing good things. So tell me a little bit about how you make that status quo a reality because of how it can be perceived. It can also be perceived through the eyes of I'm not experiencing it. So it doesn't exist, which happens a lot or very much as more recently is I don't support uh, these notions or where it's going. But let's focus on the, the not even recognizing the, the current problem since like you said, it's such an important part before you move on. Yeah, it it, it is. I, I think for me, it can be very helpful for let's just say a leadership team or a leader, or even a group of managers or directors in an organization to take stock of where they are. And the question that I like to start with is, what's true now? And when I ask that question, when I'm facilitating in an organization, the idea behind the question is that there are many truths, right? So you might be able to see things or know things that I, in my position, can't see and can't know. So we're not trying to say who's right or who's wrong. We're inviting everybody to answer this question, right? What's true today? And I think when I go to answer that question as a leader, I have to allow myself to say the positive truths, the neutral truths, and potentially the negative or even frightening truths. So the truth today might be, we have a strong mission and a strong membership organization, and our mission is holding up and we have good funding, but I'm not sure about our future, given the changes in our field. Those all could be true, right? And so I think when we do the what's true now exercise, we allow ourselves to actually see our assets, but also see our 
question marks or our deficits or our the constraints of what we have. For example, we have huge aspirations, but a limited budget could be true. As we answer the question without judgment, we generate a set of t- talking points that are uh, that allow us to move into the next step, which I would simply use the good old-fashioned SWOT analysis with my group. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And now that, you know, once we've generated a whole perspective on what's true now, let's talk about the strengths we have working for us. Let's talk about the weaknesses that we have to acknowledge, whether we like it or not, just say what they are. And both strengths and weaknesses are looking internally. So looking at the organizational system itself. Then we go to opportunities. What are the opportunities that we have? And what are the threats that could derail us or could overcome us if we don't name them and notice them and begin to work with them. And you'll notice that opportunities and threats are externally focused. And in my work, when we do this combination, what's true now, and then we look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we're able to get a perspective on what's true in our current state at this time. And sometimes in my work, we'll we'll actually look at the field. For example, if I'm working with a law firm, we might look at what's true in the field of law in the profession right now, What's what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in that larger field. Or we might look at healthcare is another one that right now is really disrupted. What are the trends? What are the challenges, pressures, and realities that extend beyond us? What are those big challenges that our field is seeing? And then we'll go to the organization itself and do the same exercise. And when you allow a group or, or even just yourself to really reflect and and dig into these questions, what comes out of it is that you've actually recorded what you have going for you, which you need to pay attention to because you really want to build on strengths. But you're also allowing a discussion of where you're vulnerable as an organizational system and potentially places where the field, the professional field you're in is changing and those changes could affect you. I find in the work that I do, when we do this current state discussion, people often experience a great deal of relief because the conversation is we're finally talking about the things that we see and worry about and think about all the time. We're finally putting it out in a constructive way. We can see it. We can talk about it. We're not afraid to talk about it. And and because it's often a, a group exercise, many eyes see different things. And so we actually gain a more holistic perspective. Yeah, that sounds so important in in terms of those different perspectives, as you mentioned, because the the truth is seen from different perspectives. And that's so important to contribute to this. But I love that experience of actually naming those fears and naming the the challenges and the worries. Yeah, there, there is such a great sense of relief. It's like a bouncy ball that you're trying to push under the water. It's going to keep bouncing back up anyway. So it's so important to, to do that. And then know that you're actually not worrying about them. You're actually then taking action towards changing them. I think that's right. And interestingly enough, once we do the what's true now, and then we do the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we have one more step to do, which is, What holds us back? And that question goes straight to our fears, our sense of a deficit, our scarcity mindset, whatever it is. And so again, when we ask that question, what holds us back? It's a moment of truth. And people often share quite vulnerably about the risks that they don't want to take. And what I love about the SWAT exercise coming before that question is we suddenly are able to see our strengths and our opportunities. And there's usually a great impetus for change because now that we've talked about our current state, we realize if we just keep operating at the status quo, we're not actually going to meet the competitive threats. We're not going to seize our opportunities. We actually do need to make change. So what's holding us back? And we name it and then we move on. And so I, I love that you put your finger on that word fear because I think very often we believe that our fears are true when they're really just our fears. And if there's one thing that we know, it's that our fear lives in the future. The things we're afraid of haven't actually happened, (laughs) but we act as if they have. So I, I think that these exercises that I'm describing can be a really good way to clear yourself of the kinds of thoughts that are barriers to leading change or making change. And I think that's one thing that, 
I, I feel like people could do more of is actually recognize the fear and risk that the people see in change. They're not necessarily dying to disrupt change and not be cooperative or be resistant just for the hell of it. It's because they actually have reasons to think that there were some strengths in the old system as well. One of the systems change models that I like really talks about using the strengths of the old system as the compost for the new system. But again, there's going to be people that see those strengths as strengths and, and not see the weaknesses. So it's again, they're not necessarily going to want to have change. And, and those can be very valid reasons because they think if it's working for them then it is much harder to see why would we change and i think the idea that what we're doing already has strength and that strength can be repurposed or leaned into right is very empowering i think people often fear that in a change environment they have to give up everything and i think where we can find things to build upon it can really help and I think that going back to that article about the managers and their experience of saying, I, I work for a good company, we can't be a company that's not equal already. If we can reframe that to saying, you're working for a company who is doing everything to make itself become equal, right? It's on the journey to that very valid goal. But admitting that you're on the journey it is totally okay. That's more truthful than pretending that you're already there. I think so. And one thing that you and I have explored a little bit, Jacqueline, in the past is strategies for framing change or leading. How do you get people to be able to take it in and work with the change that's necessary without becoming overwhelmed by it? And one thing that I like to do in my work is to think about, the, to break that. So we know the vision where we want to be in, let's just say, three years. I like to then ask the question, if we stand in that future, three years from now, and we look back to today, what would we have to be doing in year one, year two, year three, to get to that future? And I think that idea of standing in the future, looking back at today, and allowing our desired future to guide our strategic choices and our, our priorities helps to really explain to people sort of the reason for the change, like the vision is the reason for the change. And in our work, sometimes we break it into phases. We really use like year one, year two, year three, or at my own company, the Nebo company, we will we call it bridge one, bridge two, bridge three. And we say we're bridging to the future. Bridge one is going to be about setting the foundation, getting ready. Bridge two is going to be about building the capacity that we need to scale our growth. And bridge three is going to be about bringing it all to integration and culture or something like that. And so I think as you start to make the future not seem so far away by breaking the path to that future into manageable defined bridges or phases, it can help people focus and feel more clear about what's expected or needed from them. I think that's so important. I always would think about that as reverse engineering. I worked often with computer scientists too. And, and that was really, I loved that process of saying, okay, where do we want to get to? It's that when you've got to the top of the mountain, what does it look like? And then how would you get there? And I think not only does that help you identify the necessary steps, it also just then when you are able to share those steps, that gives people so much confidence that they know, okay, here's the steps I'm taking to this long-term vision that you have a commitment to. This is not just, oh, we're going to work on this next month and, and, and here's my one idea, right? It's like you say, it's a long-term phased process, which I think is important. But I also like your bridges to have the foundational conditions for change, which I think is often overlooked. Because again, if there's not psychological safety, for example, it's very hard to introduce change. And then phase two, I had that as the skills development and, and really making sure you have the, the, the capacity and the competencies. And then the three is how do you then codify those things in longer term processes and systems? So I also think that's such an important way to go. Whereas I think some people start with and point three, let's make the culture, <laughs> but not really understanding, okay, what would it take? What does it actually take through our human behavior change and learning processes to do 
because that's what I often am, am asking people is about their logic model. Okay, what is your hypothesis how this will actually work? And what, what do you actually imagine point A is related to point B? Like, why would one thing lead to the other? And that's where I often then see, okay, people's understanding of sort of some of these constructs and sort of behavior change or psychology, whichever you want to put it, are kind of misunderstood. The importance of confidence, how much that fits into this journey and has such an important role. And that, for example, I'm often explaining to people confidence is actually we measure it by your confidence to overcome barriers, right? So you've got to start thinking of those barriers from the beginning to know whether you're going to develop the confidence to overcome them. So I think those are some of the, to me, the missing steps that when you don't have it broken down can happen. I think that's true. And when I've seen many organizations where if you just go out into the organization and you say, how are things going? And what do you think is the future of the organization? the understanding of the vision and the direction of the organization or the company is gets more and more limited. In other words, the farther away you get from the leadership team, the fewer people really understand what it is we're doing and why. I think that to me is another litmus test of effective leadership when you're leading change is, is the story of change clearly told and in a compelling, memorable way. So that if I bumped into somebody at the grocery store and they said, hey, what's new at in your company, what's happening there, I could say, we're going through a big change process because we want to come out in this place and we're it's requiring a lot of everybody. We're working really hard, but we know that this is going to be a, a, a great place to land and it's very innovative. So would I be able to answer that question in a clear, simple way, or do I get lost in the strategic planning and all the language and the rhetoric? And so that to me is one of the things that, that I look for when I'm looking at how to lead change effectively is, are you telling the story of the future and of how we're going to get there in a way that anybody could understand and remember? I love that. So that must be definitely one of your change strategies that you use that's effective. So tell me about some others that you find really helps people along this journey. I think we have to learn from our own learning. And what I mean by that is we start out to do something And we sure do know a whole lot more about that something three months into it than we did at the beginning, no matter how prepared we think we are. So one thing that I like to see leaders do is to take stock of where we started, where we are now, what we learned, and what we now are going to do. So the idea of just launching it down the path and then only talking about like the outcomes. Did we achieve the goal? Yes or no. I'd like to see leaders talking about what are we learning? What is this teaching us about our organization, about our industry, about ourselves? And how is what we're learning making us stronger as an organization prepared to to be successful at this change process? Or are we learning something that is fundamentally revealing about us? Uh, One common example is we set such huge goals, they're not attainable. We're learning that our goals, what we thought was a six-month goal is really a 12-month goal. Can we get better at goal setting? And so it's really this idea of not assuming that just because you said in January, this was the plan, that plan is going to make sense as you get smarter in the change process and that you, you need stopping points to assess not only what are we achieving, but also what are we learning. I think that's so important to have formal learning cycles where you're basically saying, one, what can we improve because of what we've learned? But also, yeah, we assume we know what's going to work. And essentially, that's what change is, finding out what does work. Because even if it works for one team or in one unit of a business, it may not transfer across to another without adaptation. And to me, that's part of that learning process is expecting there to be adaptations in the rollout and very much using that more experimental approach so that it's basically we're seeing what works. We're testing this. Yes, we're going to evaluate and learn from what we're discovering along the way. I think that's so important, especially the emphasis on saying, look what we have learned, look how we have progressed in our understanding for that to be a foundation of strengths as well. 
I think too, the goal setting is so important. I know people do things like smart goals where it's measurable and timely and relevant. And I think people are terrible at goal setting because we do not know what we can achieve. We're often overconfident, actually. And that can be such a time where we need to provide support to people because they're overconfident in what they can achieve. Or actually just the the relevancy of the goal. I I often tell the story of my husband setting himself an exercise goal and me really trying to dig in and say, why that particular goal? But he was following somebody else at work who was doing the same goal. So he decided that's what he wanted to do. So I tried to support him with all the kind of behavior change tools I knew. But sure enough, it wasn't a good goal for him. And actually what he needed to do was do exercise that helped with injury prevention. That was his biggest struggle. And of course, this other goal led to injury. (laughs) I really try and not necessarily get too tied in this whole goal setting process, because my guess is the goal is going to be not appropriate anyways. Okay, let's set it, but then let's just see where we get, because that's really, when you start doing it, um, you start to see you may be off kilter a bit. (laughs) And you can get better and better at setting appropriate goals, if you're willing to acknowledge the problem with the goal. And I think about, I don't know what year it was for me, but some time ago, I I remember noticing that at the end of every year, we seem to fall short of our goals. And the feeling that we had was one that we didn't accomplish everything we set out for ourselves. And I began to realize that was a disempowering experience It was a confidence diminishing experience by employees. And so I began to work on setting goals that were absolutely steps on the path to the right direction, but that were better, better defined, more achievable and setting fewer. And as we got better at achieving those goals, what I noticed was that the confidence of the organization went way up. And the confidence of each individual who then began to see themselves as we did it instead of we didn't quite do it or we almost did it or we didn't even come close. And so I would say from a leadership as you lead change, better in many ways to be extremely pragmatic and realistic, even if you feel like setting goal aspirational goals that really would pull the whole organization forward, especially in the beginning, set goals that can be achieved and celebrated because that momentum can create, I want to say, a sense of confidence and real willingness to act courageously within the organization. If It's really interesting to miss your goals repeatedly, what that feels and what that can do to a culture. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that is so important because if that is a history that you have of missing goals, when you even work with somebody one-to-one, and I've worked with clients who are coaches and trying to encourage the, their leaders to set goals, and the leaders don't want to do the goal exercise. And I'm saying, it's not surprising, they probably failed at a bunch of goals. So setting goals is really uncomfortable for lots of people if you haven't had good experiences with them. And so that was where she then realized, oh, I have to step back and acknowledge that. I have to acknowledge how goals, even setting goals, creates fear again, back to that that change. When I, for leading change in the organizational system is, I, I think that leaders have to cultivate agility at looking at the organization and the external environment. You have to be able to, I call it helicopter way up. Imagine you're in a helicopter and you go way up high and you can suddenly see all the mountains and fields and rivers and lakes, right? From that vantage point, you have this big picture view, right? And that's where very often vision, understanding the external environment or the competitive landscape, all of that is up there, right? You also have to be able to helicopter down to the level of strategy, And strategy always answers the question, how? Vision answers the question, where are we going? Strategy answers the question, how are we going to get there? And at that level, we're really setting strategic priorities and maybe we're building strategic plans. And the goals and the tactics are even lower as you helicopter even lower to goals, even lower to tactics, and now we're on the ground. But I think very often people have thought as you become a more senior leader, you spend more time up in the visionary space, up in the clouds. And what I'm noticing about leading in modern times is that leaders need to be able to helicopter up and down, often in the course of a day, 
as needed to maintain the perspective that is required. So if you're setting strategic direction, you want to be helicoptered up high, right? Having a high level conversation. But an hour later, you could be in a meeting of managers who are going to execute on that. You need to helicopter down and be able to talk effectively about goals and tactics. And so I think what I notice is we all have a preference. Some of us, we're tacticians. We want to know, what do I need to do this week? We're down at the level of what's next. Others of us love to be in that big picture space. And I guess the challenge I would give us all is, can you develop more versatility so that you are able to see that big system, but also understand how to operate from inside that system? Yeah, I often describe it as that that you have to be able to see the forest and the individual trees because you've got to be able to see both. But I think one of my other guests um, that I've interviewed, people can listen back to that episode too, which is about the right leader for the right time. So again, if you do have a, a strength in the innovation stage, you might not then be the person that that, that leads the company through the, the execution stage. So again, recognizing that we do sometimes have these strengths and preferences and that we don't, we can't necessarily be the right leader all the time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Sometimes the self-awareness is really to recognize that one needs to be adaptive, right? You, None of us is the perfect leader for every situation, right? But are you able to see the adaptation that you need to make to be more effective based on what, like I would normally do this, but in this situation, I need to do something a little differently in order to be effective. And so I, I love the idea of the right leader at the right time. And I also challenge us to believe that we can, with self-awareness, be adaptive. I think that makes sense. Any other specific change strategies that you want to describe? And again, it's really helpful for the audience to even think about, without naming names, but specific examples where you've taken leaders or companies through specific common problems where listeners could think, oh, yes, we can apply that to our situation too. Is there anything like that you can share at this stage? Oh gosh, so many examples come to my mind, Jacqueline, but let me think of a good one. I think I'd like to share an example of an educational organization that worked together to create a vision for the future. And it really was a detailed description of a desired future. And it was pretty exciting and they did a great job of rolling it out. So it was created as a part of a visioning process and they looked at where have we been who have we been? What was our founding story? How did we get to today? What is our current reality? What's our current state, our, our, our present day story? And what's that future story of where we want to be? And I think they did, they, I think they did five years and they brought the vision out to their organization. They were fairly large. I think there were a few thousand people in the organization and they hosted these open kind of town hall type feedback cafes, we called them. And we invited people to react and whether it was rotten vegetables or it was something really innovative and constructive to just weigh in and help again, shape the vision. The vision was finished and the board of trustees signed off on it. And the next question was, okay, how do we get from here to there? And how do we do this or doing our day jobs? And the decision was made to create a change team and the change team was about eight people whose job was to take the big ideas and the vision and begin to work across the organizational system to build a sequenced year over year plan. So their job was to actually think about how do we get there from here? And that team, which was called the transformation team, met weekly for a couple of years to really create momentum And I think what the leader of the transformation team discovered was that the transformation team was so ready to go. And the challenge for the organization was how do we include the perspective of the transformation team? Like our company is already operating the way it operates. We aren't used to having to listen to them. We aren't used to having to be challenged or being invited to think about changing our systems. So there was a period of adoption where the transformation team really had to build credibility and trust with the existing structures of the organization. And they had to figure out how they were gonna report their progress, how they were gonna report on their priorities, how they were gonna communicate what they were working on and how they were gonna build that story of progress and change that would 
create that momentum in the organization. And so it was a really, it's been really interesting to watch this happen. And I think one of the critical best practices was for the leadership team at the top to fully embrace and endorse the transformational team and to listen to them, to hear from them on a monthly basis and also to remove barriers for that team and to support them in that work. But I give the example because I think we're, we all set out to make change. We're often asking a really busy group of people to do things differently and, and new on top of their regular jobs. And I thought that this example of an organization that really created a small team to really lead progress and to, to lead the organization on the change path was a great example. I like that example. And I think that's something that's been missing. We often maybe have a single DEI leader and perhaps a DEI committee or something, but it, it's not a team of people dedicated to these tasks. And I also think too, there aren't necessarily people in place. For example, there isn't a, a kind of culture officer in, in organizations really creating a group of people that can acknowledging how big change is and how challenging it is and basically responding with an appropriate response which is the right amount of human resources invested in it is so important yeah it's really true and there's a phrase that a mentor of mine once wrote out for me and i was a young professional and it's a i believe it's a greek phrase pantarai it means everything is always moving and changing and so when we think about the world, we tend to want to get to where we want it. And then good, we did it. Here we are. It's safe. This is the way it is now. The reality is that we're in a continuous change process. And so when we begin to understand that we can shape change and we can influence change, but we're never going to reach a status quo, that's the end point. I think the whole thing becomes a lot more fun. It's really about thinking about how can I influence and shape the outcomes we really want in this time period, knowing that we're going to keep learning, as we said before, from the process and that the changes will, that change will continue just as the changes in the world continue beyond the three-year period of our change plan or whatever it is. And so it unhooks you from thinking about that, that everything is about succeeding or failing. And I think it puts you into a, a much more creative experimental mindset. Yes, I love that. But it's so funny that the, the words you've used there is everything is always moving and changing and we want to get to the point where we can stop and be safe, right? So that is what we sort of see, that we feel safe when we're not changing. Uh, so I think that's so insightful because that's the state we do want to get to. Um, and I, I'm definitely um, in favor of thinking about the creativity and the innovation and, and having the confidence to do it because you are, you're experimenting, you're doing what we said before, learning from the learning. So, so this is not so frightening because you, you've got these touch points along the way where you're checking, is it going how we expected? And actually, you're actually going, oh, it didn't go how we expected. Surprise, it happens all the time. That's just the norm, right? And so what I, so I love that you're trying to then get people to embrace that, that the fun element of this. I think what I have a, a real problem with is when we try to say that change is easy because we know people are afraid of it. So we try and say it's easy so that they can do it, but it's not easy. Tell me a little bit about how we can communicate that better. Because as soon as we say change is difficult, it's like... Everyone switches off. They don't want to know. So yeah, help me think about this change branding around <laughs> it being fun, but not ignoring the difficulties that it does include. I think when we think about change, we often think that we're going to have to give something up. We begin to feel like something's going to be lost, right? You're asking me to be different than I am. You're asking us to be different than we are. Is the way I am and the way we are valued? Is it understood? Is it is the past valued, right? And so when I think about creates this resistance to change sometimes, I think that people prefer what they're familiar with and quite often asking us to change towards something we haven't yet experienced feels very risky. And so when I think about that, I, I think about it with a great deal of compassion. In other words, I think it's natural to have a, re a resistance to change and when we shift gears and we reframe 
change so that we're not thinking of change as something bad or good. We're thinking of it as something inevitable that we can shape and we can grow from. Then I think we can roll up our sleeves and be creative. I think the shift that I look, look to see is a shift from being reactive and protective and defensive, right? To, to being curious and creative and experimental and humble enough to say, oh, not working. Oh, yep, it is working, but that was by accident, but we can learn from that. So I think for me, the shift from reactivity to creativity toward an intentional desired future is the recipe. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope the podcast brings you fresh ideas, renewed confidence and energy to keep leading change. If you need a partner in these efforts, I can help you effectively build a thriving workplace culture for all. I'll help you overcome the real barriers to change you face every day and help you lead real change with evidence-based solutions. In particular, I want to work with passionate leaders who have tried and failed. Because I know you have what it takes and your experience will help you clearly recognize the difference I can make. For a free consultation today, please visit my website at www.leading.com hyphen real hyphen change.com that's www leading real change.com take control you're a fighter